mothers, we want to be honouring you today. This is a very special day uh, for you as we want to be honouring you. And, uh, and so to start off with, for my short message, uh, we're actually going to be looking to the screen and we're going to be playing a short video for your pleasure. So what'd you get, Natalie, for Mother's Day? Well, nothing yet. You know it's tomorrow, right? But yeah. Oh, we have this thing. I take him to the drugstore. He picks out something he thinks his mom would like. <laughs> so cute. You should see her face when she opens those gifts. So last year, I got batteries and this. <laughs> what is that? No idea. But I love the expressions that they make when they think that I'm using the gifts that they bought me. She loves that thing. And you know the best part? Drugstores? Open 24 hours a day. Hey, buddy, wake up. We gotta go shopping. You forgot Mother's Day again, didn't you? Mine's a little more complicated. Unfortunately, I married into her family's long tradition of epic Mother's Day gifts. Bill? A new car? And now, Mother's Day? just makes me sweat. A diamond tennis bracelet? She doesn't even play tennis. France? France? Man, you really overthink this Mother's Day thing. I had a really great idea for Mother's Day this year. Daniel was gonna make this great card, then the glue spilled, and the glitter spilled, and it spilled all over the dog, and that dog will never be the same. And as much as I try to explain to Dave that my father's just making up for years of being absent, but he still completely stresses over Mother's Day. And then, then I just panicked. I ended up buying her an eed weeder, a, a feed weeder. Weed eater? She likes to garden. I cannot give my wife something that eats weeds. Why can't I stop sweating? Calm down, my man. Hello? Just think of a gift that reflects who she is as a mother. That's a problem. There is not a gift out there that would even come close to show her what an amazing mom she is. What kind of gift says... No, no! <laughs> Something about nail polish? <laughs> Got it. He just shot me. Oh. Mom, have you seen my... Got it. How are you? Thanks. Buddy? Could you tell me more about God? <sighs> you got it. <laughs> Thanks for waiting. They let me go today. But it's okay. Right. God's got this. Yeah. God has blessed me and the kids, this wonderful woman. How do you wrap that up and put a bow on it? She is the gift. I heard you loud and clear. You love and appreciate me. That's all I need. No bow required. What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> you pocket called me. <laughs> Sweaty. Oh, my, no. <laughs>
Hello? Hey, babe. I mean, we're still good with that whole drugstore thing we got going on, right? Ow. You still there? Let's, uh, let's give a round of applause for all of our mums out there. Why do we celebrate Mother's Day? That's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer me on that one. Uh, you know what? It's good. It's a, it's a day. It's one day of the year at least that we can show our appreciation and we can celebrate because at the end of the day, we all recognize that mums are really special. And they're more than just, uh, you know, being a mother and motherhood is more than simply a biological function, isn't it? It is. It's, you know, there's something special that happens, a bond that happens between a mother and their children. You know, when we think about who our mothers are and, and, and that we, mothers are our first nurturers. The ones, the first ones that take us in their arms, look after us, nurture us, they mother us, and they display all the virtues of self-sacrifice because that's just kind of what mums do. Mums sacrifice themselves for their kids. You know, they carried us, didn't they? You know, every single one of us, I think, here would say yes. yes. <laughs> right? We were all, they carried us for those nine months. And when we were born, they fed us, right? They, they held us, they pulled us near, and we fed. Our mothers are the ones who gave us that life. They nurtured us from the womb straight through and, and, and fed us and nurtured us. So mums hold a really, really special place in our hearts. Mothers were our first teachers, the first ones who began to teach us things. And, uh, you know, they were the first ones and probably the ones who gave us the most correction too, let's face it. I mean, you know, my dad, you know, he was, he, you know, he did discipline me, but it was my mum, probably because she was the one that caught me more than anything else. You know, but it was my mum. She was the one who disciplined me. So she was the one that kind of helped me stay on the straight and narrow. And, uh, and, and still today, she continues to do that with diligence, disciplining me when I get things wrong. So uh, mothers never stop being mothers, and we never stop being their kids. So who did we turn to when we were feeling happy? Who would we turn to when we felt sad? You know, I know that, you know, when my kids... Right when they upset, right, they just go straight by me, <laughs> and they head to Becky because that's where they go when they want to be comforted, when they want to feel nurtured, when they need that kind of something more, that emotional connection. Uh, then they go to Becky um, because they know that Dad's he's just going to try and fix them, and Mum's just going to put her arms around them and give them a big hug, and uh, you know, and I'm kind of like going. I'm redundant. <laughs> but that's okay because when they break something, then they come to me and I feel good because I can fix it. But, you know, when they want to do that, you know, when they've hurt themselves, they've grazed their knee, it's always mum they go to. Because let's face it, mums are just a lot better at that kind of thing than I am. So when my kids come to me and they've got a grazed knee when they were younger, not so much nowadays, um, you know, and uh, that was the end of their world. Well, I mean, if they hadn't lost an arm or a leg, then it was just, you know, you'll be right, get over it. <laughs> you know, get back out there and play. But mums do something different. Mums just connect heart to heart in that moment with their anxiousness and their pain. And, and they just love their kids. That's what mums do. And that's why we love our mums. Who do we still turn to when we need advice? We still go to our mums. We still go to mums for advice. And uh, we can turn to books. You know, there's lots of self-help books out there. There's lots of Christian books out there. You can get some great advice from. You can even come and see your pastor. But you still go to your mum when you want advice. You still go to your mum because your mum's wisdom carries something that nobody else does. And so mums are really special. That kind of wisdom that a mother carries is born out of something very special. It's not knowledge. You know, dads carry lots of knowledge, but mums carry wisdom. And that wisdom is born out of self-sacrifice. There's something that just happens when I see, uh, you know, uh, when I remember Becky and I, when, when we first got married, 
You know, we spent five years together before we had kids, and we had an amazing time <laughs> before kids turned up. But nobody, when, they, when the kids showed up, well, they didn't just show up, did they? They kind of, we, we, we worked at it for a, for a while. And, um, <laughs> but something changed, you know, something changed in Becky. Because there's just something that's intuitive that begins to kick in with motherhood, and uh, and then and I saw how she began to give of herself for her kids, and and it's a transformation that as a husband I got to see that I didn't know about. I mean I didn't know that was going to happen, yeah. and so but 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 the change happened because there's something instinctive in in every mother which is self-sacrificial, and they just give of themselves. For their kids and that in itself creates a special kind of wisdom because when somebody loves you that much and somebody cares for you that much that they're willing to sacrifice themselves and their own feelings sacrifice their time sacrifice so much about themselves it's all for others and it's all for the ones whom they love and you can't replace that with anything nobody's going to love you more than your mother loved you that wisdom which they carry is a price which is far, far more than just material possessions. Far more than, than gold and silver and all those other kind of things. All the material things, all the luxuries that, that we can gain in life, you cannot compare with your mother's wisdom. You know, Proverbs, that amazing book that's right in the middle of the Bible, uh, personifies wisdom as a woman. Now, when I thought about this, oh, why? Why would be? Why does the Bible talk about wisdom in terms of of wisdom being a woman? You know, we think about God. God has lots of male attributes, doesn't he? You know, we call him Father. You know, God is a warrior. Uh, he's, you know, so there's lots of kind of images that we have of God being male, but then it comes to wisdom, and and the Bible chooses to personify God's wisdom as a feminine quality. When I think about all those things that, that you know, women are like, mothers are like, I, I, I understand. I understand it in the light of the fact that, that this wisdom which women carry just in who they are, in their life's experience, that's born out of that self-sacrifice. It makes sense to me. So in the Bible, wisdom and the wisdom of God is referred to as he or as she and her. Let's have a, a look at Proverbs 3, verse 13 to 18. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the grain from her is better, the gain from her is better than the gain from silver, and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you can desire. And compare to her. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She's a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. Why do you think the writers of Proverbs refer to wisdom? <coughs> as being a woman. You know, fathers instruct, don't they? That's what we do. We tell people what to do, right? We've got all the knowledge, we have all the answers, and we like to tell people. Not so with the women. Women teach us the way to live. So guys, you know, we have instruction. We instruct other people. But mothers, they show us the way that we should go. They show us the way that we should live. And Proverbs says that woman, that wisdom is to be more prized than precious gems. In fact, it says that return on her investment, her ROI, is greater than what you're going to get if you invest in gold and if you invest in silver. You're going to get far greater return from wisdom than you are from those things. Now, I find it interesting when I read this particular passage that uh, verse 18 mentions wisdom as a tree of life. Where else do we read about a tree of life? We read about it in Genesis, don't we? A tree of life. 
In, uh, in Genesis 2 and verse 8 and 9, it talks about two trees that God plants in this garden, right at the very beginning of creation. And in one part, he plants this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in another place, he plants this tree of life. And what we read in Genesis is that after the fall, the Adam and Eve are barred from the way of the tree of life in case they eat of it and live forever. Because after they've eaten from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they, they fell. All right? So sin entered into them because they were told not to eat from that. And if they were to reach out their hand and grab hold of that tree of life, they would have lived forever in a fallen state. And God didn't want that. He didn't want humanity to be in a fallen state forever. He wanted a way out for them. And so he barred the way to the tree of life. And then we come to Proverbs. And we read in Proverbs here that wisdom is a tree of life. That's interesting, isn't it? Not the tree of life. That's long gone, right? But wisdom itself is like the tree of life because that is the way that we should walk. Because God's ways are wisdom. And when we walk in God's ways, it's like a tree of life for us. It, it, it produces all these things that we just read. But the path of wisdom will always lead to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Who here owes their salvation to a praying mother or a praying grandmother? Yeah, there's quite a number of us here who would say, you know, the reason why I'm here today, the reason why I'm in church today is because my mother prayed for me or my grandmother prayed for me. Again, it's that heart of a mother. It's that self-sacrifice. That mother just sees her kids, knows what's right, knows the right way for them to go, and begins to pray. Pray for their kids. Pray that they will come to know Christ. And that is something that is just born out of just who they are. There's that selflessness about them that they want to see the goodness of God come to their children and their children's children. My mum. She prayed for me. She was the one in my family. She was the first person in my family that ever came to know the Lord. And it was because she prayed for me and for my brothers that I came to the Lord and they came to know the Lord. And because of that, my children have grown up in church and they know the Lord. And I'm sure that those prayers will continue as we pray for them. As Becky continues to pray for them, for our kids and our grandkids, that's going to be going on and on and on. And I just I pray that that is the case. But it's because one person, my mother, prayed. That's why I'm saved. How good is that? It was my mum who taught me to read the word. It was my mother who was the one who drove me to church. It was my mother who was the one who took me to youth group. It was my mother who was the one that introduced me to uh, ministers and other older Christians who could be mentors for my life. It was my mother. Why? Because she loved me that much. She's the one that took me. In Exodus 20 and verse 12, it says, Honour your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land and the Lord your God has given you. So honouring our mothers. Where does that come from? Where does that passage of scripture come from? Exodus 20. Well. That is awesome. That is awesome. Let's give, give you an extra bag. <laughs> There's a particular, a particular place that comes from in the Old Testament. Just part of the Ten Commandments. Part of the Ten Commandments. You know, those, those, uh, those real special Ten Commandments that, that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. And those are the things we still, we still recognize those and hold on to those as being, as being right, as being true. It's part of Ten Commandments. Honor your mother. Honor your mother. It's a non-negotiable. So we honor our mothers. Even though your experience might not have been the best, you honor, we honor our mothers because that's a command. It's a command that we do this. And so that's why we celebrate mothers on Mother's Day. 
That's why we have a special day in our calendar for mothers. Because we want to honour them. And I know that that's not easy. Because your relationship with your mother might not have been ideal. Your relationship with your birth mother may, you may not even know who your birth mother is. So while we understand that, while we talk about these things, we also recognise that, that that also can sometimes be fraught with difficulty. That can be a painful memories sometimes. But nonetheless, the Lord says, honour our mothers. Even though we might not have known them, even though that might have been difficult at times, and I'm sure with, with most of us, you know, it was a mixture of some good and some bad. But we choose to honour nonetheless because honouring our parents, honouring our mothers particularly, is a choice that we make, regardless of what our relationship was like. I want to, uh, I want to show you a clip from a from a, a talk that this woman Nicole Johnson. Uh, gave, and it's, she's written this and, and she reads it out called The Invisible Woman. It started to happen gradually. I would walk into a room and say something and no one would notice. I would say, turn the TV down please, and nothing would happen. So I would get louder. Turn the TV down, please. Finally, I would have to go over and turn the TV down myself. And then I started to notice it elsewhere. My husband and I had been at a party for about three hours and I was ready to go. I looked over and he was talking to a friend from work and I walked over and he kept right on talking. He didn't even turn toward me. That's when I started to put it together. <laughs> he can't see me. <laughs> I'm invisible. I'm invisible. Then I started to notice it more and more. I would walk my son to school and his teacher would say, Jake, who's that with you? And my son would say, nobody. <laughs> Granted, he's just five, but nobody? One night a group of us gathered and we were celebrating the return of a friend from England. Janice had just taken this fabulous trip, and she was going on and on about the hotel she stayed in. And I was sitting there looking around at the other women at the table. I put my makeup on in the car on the way there. I had on an old dress because it was the only thing clean, and I had my unwashed hair pulled up in a banana clip, and I was feeling pretty darn pathetic. And then Janice turned to me, and she said, I brought you this. <laughs> It was a book on the great cathedrals of Europe. I didn't understand. And then I read her inscription. She wrote, with admiration for the greatness of what you are building when no one sees. You can't name the names of the people who built the great cathedrals. Over and over again, looking at these mammoth works, you scan down to find the names and it says builder, Unknown, unknown, unknown. They completed things not knowing that anyone would notice. There's a story about one of the builders who was carving a tiny bird inside a beam that would be covered over by a roof. And someone came up to him and said, why are you spending so much time on something no one will ever see? And it's reported that the builder replied, because God sees. They trusted that God saw everything. They gave their whole lives for a work, a mammoth work they would never see finished. They showed up day after day. Some of these cathedrals took over a hundred years to build. That was more than one working man's lifetime, day after day. And they made personal sacrifices for no credit. Showing up at a job they would never see finished for a building their name would never be on. One writer even goes so far as to say no great cathedrals will ever be built again because so few people are willing to sacrifice to that degree. I closed the book 
And it was as if I heard God say, I see you. You are not invisible to me. No sacrifice is too small for me to notice. I see every cupcake baked, every sequin sewn on, and I smile over every one. I see every tear of disappointment when things don't go the way you want them to go. But remember, you are building a great cathedral. It will not be finished in your lifetime, and sadly, you will never get to live there. But if you build it well, I will. At times, my invisibility has felt like an affliction to me. But it is not the disease that is erasing my life. It is the cure for the disease of self-centeredness. It is the antidote to my own pride. It's okay that they don't see. It's okay that they don't know. I don't want my son to tell the friend he's bringing home from college, you're not going to believe what my mom does. She gets up at four in the morning and she makes pies and hand bases turkey and she presses all the linens. Even if I do all those things, I don't want him to say that. I want him to want to come home. And secondly, I want him to say to his friend, you're going to love it there. It's okay that they don't see. We don't work for them. We work for him. We sacrifice for him. They will never see. Not if we do it right. Not if we do it well. Let's pray that our work will stand as a monument to an even greater God. John 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this and to lay one's life down for one's friend. What greater love can a mother have for a child than what she already does? Willingly and freely, she would lay down her life for her children. And she does that on a daily basis. It's not one of these great big grand, uh, you know, shows of love. It's just every day. Every day she lays it down, every day. Every day. The wisdom of mothers is born from that daily sacrifice of love. And when I look at my wife, Becky, I marvel at the tenacity that she has and her capacity for self-sacrifice for all of her kids, of whom I am the biggest. <laughs> and, you know, when I see her, you know, she just keeps on going. You, you ever seen one of those adverts for, for, for Duracell with a bunny that just keeps going? Well, that's my bunny, right? <laughs> she just keeps going. She just keeps giving, you know, well beyond the point of exhaustion. She'll just keep going because that's who she is. She's just made that way because she sacrifices herself for her family. And that's why we want to honor mums. That's why we honor you. That's why as husbands, we want to honor our wives. That's why as children, we want to honor our mothers for all the things that they do. And particularly, I think, after watching that video, for all the things that they've done that we never saw, that we never saw, that we never appreciated because we were so focused on our thing, yet they saw our thing and everyone else's thing, and they just carried on pulling it all together. So that's why we honour you today. That's why we love you. We love you for all the unseen things that you do. So I would like all the mothers in the room to stand one more time. And we will give you a round of applause for all that you do. We want to thank all of the mothers that are online and who've joined us here today as well. And we just wish that you were here with us personally, but uh, we know that you're there and we want to just appreciate you as much as those here in person. So what I want to do now is uh, I just want everybody else, if you're comfortable with this, uh, to just gather around all those women that are standing and just pray for them. 
just pray your very best prayers of blessing on them, right? Uh, just as if they're your own mother, and they might be, but as if they were your own mother and just pour out the best prayers upon them that you possibly can. And while you're doing that, I'm going to pray for the mums that are online. So out of your seats, guys, and let's just bless these, these women that are here. All right. Well, I have... That's the end of the message, but it's not the end of our thanks, and it's not the end of our appreciation, and it's not the end of us honouring you either. So uh, God bless you. Happy Mother's Day. I hope that you've got family that you can uh, go home to and enjoy and celebrate with together. And uh, uh, we, uh, we're going to have our final worship song, so I'm going to invite the band to come up. And then uh, we'll finish off. God bless you and happy Mother's Day.